This planet is often called the jewel of the solar system, probably because of how beautiful it is and how exotic it looks with colorful rings surrounding it. You've probably already guessed that I'm talking about Saturn, the second largest planet in the solar system. And the question is, can Saturn be a failed star? Now, a failed star is composed of gas, but it can't sustain nuclear fusion reactions in its core because it's not massive enough. This type of star is often referred to as a brown dwarf. Such space bodies are close in size to Jupiter, the largest planet in our solar system. But brown dwarfs have a much greater mass. Unlike other stars, they don't emit a lot of visible light since they aren't large enough to fuse hydrogen, even though brown dwarfs can fuse deuterium with lithium. Failed stars were discovered around 60 years ago. Some of the first theoretical papers describing them were published in 1962. If we talk about the first time astronomers confirmed the existence of a brown dwarf, it happened in 1988 when they spotted a space object later called GD 165b. Despite having a lot of characteristics of a star itself, this celestial body was orbiting another star and didn't meet all the necessary requirements to get this title. That's why scientists started calling it a failed star. Seems kind of harsh now, doesn't it? Since that first discovery, astronomers have spotted more than 50 other brown dwarfs. And according to the latest estimates, there might be around 25 million failed stars in our galaxy alone. Because of the lack of visible light, brown dwarfs are very difficult to spot, so this number might be inaccurate, hmm, you think? The most typical reason why a star might fail is that it doesn't manage to gather enough material to start regular stellar fusion. Now back to Saturn. The answer to the question of whether this planet might be a failed star is no. Why? The main difference between a planet and a failed star is the way they form. Stars appear when dust and gas collapse in a primordial cloud. That's why they contain low amounts of metals. At the same time, planets have significantly less mass than stars. That's why they have much lower gravities. And one of the main reasons why Saturn isn't a failed star is that it didn't start its life with enough mass to get the status of a star. A brown dwarf accumulates its star material in a similar way a star does, rather than following the method planets use. Thanks to their high gravity, failed stars can easily hold on to relatively light elements, like helium and hydrogen. For Saturn to become a failed star, it would need to be 50 times its current mass. But even if the gas giant decided to go through with the plan of becoming a brown dwarf, there simply wouldn't be enough material orbiting the Sun for this to happen. Any of the gas giants in our solar system, Jupiter or Saturn, would need at least 10 to 15 times more material to grow into a failed star. Not something you'd normally aspire to. You see, the Sun contains around 99.86% of the mass of the entire solar system. So, even if you combined all other materials in our star system, it still wouldn't be enough to create a star, even a failed one. Brown dwarfs and regular stars have a lot in common. Both start their lives as giant balls of gas. Both have protostellar cores. All of them start nuclear reactions and produce a lot of heat. Many failed stars produce some light too, but it mostly lies in the infrared spectrum. Now, let's look at the differences between these kinds of stars. A regular star releases light and energy due to thermonuclear reactions going on in its core, converting hydrogen into lithium. But a failed star doesn't have the mass to achieve this. Plus, failed stars are much smaller than regular stars, which generally possess more than 80 times the mass of Jupiter. A regular star normally has a gravitational pull strong enough to form a solar system with planets orbiting around it. As for brown dwarfs, they often orbit other stars. There's only one known failed star with a planet orbiting it. And I'm curious, why did scientists call it a failed star? Seems sort of academically judgmental to me. Did it get an F on some exam? How about other labels, 
disappointing star or came up short star. But I digress. Okay then, how about Jupiter? After all, this gas giant is larger than Saturn. In fact, it's the largest planet in the solar system. Plus, this planet and the Sun are basically made of the same stuff. Both are mostly composed of hydrogen and helium with traces of other chemicals and elements. But the Sun is over 1,000 times the mass of Jupiter. If you place these two space bodies side by side, the gas giant would look tiny next to our star. So what makeover would Jupiter need to undergo to turn into a star? If it wanted to be as large as our Sun, it would have to increase its mass by a factor of over 1,000. On the other hand, the Sun isn't the smallest or least massive star out there. There are red dwarfs, stars with the lowest mass. The smallest of them can be a mere 7.5% of the mass of the Sun. So if Jupiter was striving to be called a star, it would be much more realistic for it to become a red dwarf. In this case, it would have to increase its mass by a factor of 80 or so. Interestingly, there's a tiny star in the Milky Way galaxy which is smaller than Jupiter. This is a red dwarf about 36,660 miles across that lies 600 light-years away from Earth. It makes the red dwarf one of the smallest known stars capable of supporting hydrogen fusion. Okay, we figured out that neither Saturn nor Jupiter can be called a failed star. But what if these two gas giants collided? Would they merge into one gas giant, which would then turn into a brown dwarf? Of course, at the moment, we're unlikely to see Jupiter and Saturn collide, which is a good thing. But let's speak about a hypothetical situation and its consequences. So, some time ago, scientists were sure that Saturn and Jupiter played similar games. At some point in the past, both planets reached the stage where they needed to vacuum up tremendous amounts of material in a relatively short period of time. But apparently, Jupiter got luckier in the process. Still, according to some studies, Saturn never had a running chance. You see, the critical threshold where a planet can gain a huge amount of hydrogen and helium is about 100 times the mass of our planet. And Jupiter indeed easily beats it, which might mean that it managed to acquire the lion's share of material in the outer solar system before the Sun blew it away. Uranus and Neptune turned out to be far too small to take part in this race for power. As for Saturn, it's right in the transition zone. Had it been a bit bigger, it could have probably competed with Jupiter for the title of the largest planet in the solar system. But instead of fighting its main competitor, Saturn got stuck. It grew large enough to attract a significant amount of hydrogen and helium with the help of its gravitational pull. But it wasn't enough to kickstart the process of nuclear fusion and get going. It means that, despite all the similarities they share, Jupiter and Saturn evolved along totally different tracks. And if these two planets collided, they wouldn't merge into one planet, let alone a star. If it was a head-on collision, the planets would destroy each other. Their gas envelopes would be eliminated, and the remains of their solid cores would be catapulted into the vacuum of the cosmos. But if the collision happened at an angle, the planets would probably survive it. But in both cases, the planets would lose a massive portion of their material. In one more collision scenario, the gas giants would simply slide across each other at an oblique angle. It would result in a change in their shapes, but wouldn't alter the composition or mass of the planets. Hmm, can we call that a failed collision? How disappointing! What would the Earth look like if it was born in another solar system? I did a little research for you to find out, and the results were surprisingly wholesome. There are some warm tropics, strong winds, and giant dragonflies. But okay, let me explain from the very beginning. Since 1995, NASA has discovered more than 4,100 planets outside the solar system. Unfortunately, most of them are either flying ice balls like Neptune or gas giants like Jupiter. But there are still as many as 161 planets similar to our Earth. And one of them is very close to us, 
in the Alpha Centauri constellation. There are three stars in this constellation. Two of them are called Alpha Centauri A and Alpha Centauri B. If you live in the southern hemisphere, you've probably seen them. They're very bright. Because of that, they look like one big star. They rotate around each other very slowly. And there's the third star, chilling around not far from them. It's a teeny tiny red dwarf, Proxima Centauri. It got its name because of its proximity to our Sun. This star is the most interesting one, so let's talk more about it. Proxima Centauri is only 4.5 light years away from us. Oh, and one light year is about 6 trillion miles. Yep. If we went there, it would have taken just a little over 165,000 years of traveling in a space shuttle. Oh, you think that's a lot? For the universe, it's like checking on your fridge. Proxima Centauri is much lighter and much smaller than the Sun. It's also two times colder than the Sun, with a temperature of 3,000 Kelvin. That's why we can't see it without a telescope. On the bright side, though, it will burn for trillions of years. And you don't have to worry that one day it will eat us like our Sun. And yes, our twin planet is located right next to Proxima Centauri. This planet is called Proxima b. Yeah, I know, they got creative with all these names. I hope you won't get confused. It's slightly larger and more massive than the Earth. This planet is located in the habitable zone of Proxima Centauri. It means that there can be water and even some microorganisms there. Yes, it's possible that one day we'll find some life there. But right now, we don't know much about this mysterious planet. It's probably a rocky planet like our Earth and has a similar landscape, but this is just a theory. Who knows what kind of jokes the universe can throw at us? It would be a shame to fly 165,000 years just to stumble upon a giant piece of ice or something. Fortunately, we probably don't have to wait that long. The big brains are now developing a technology that would allow us to move at the speed close to the speed of light. If they succeed, we'll get to Proxima b in just 20 years. But anyway, this video is not just about Proxima b. It's about what would have happened if life had originated not in our solar system, but in Alpha Centauri. What if we were orbiting Proxima Centauri or the other two stars? So now, let's imagine that the Earth has replaced Proxima b. I'm going to call this new planet New Earth. Guess I'm not very creative at naming either. First of all, the orbit. The new Earth must be about 25 times closer to its star than Proxima b is. Otherwise, it would be unimaginably cold. Let's move the planet a little closer. Excellent. The day still lasts 24 hours, but our orbital period is very high. Proxima b revolves around its star in 11 days. But we'll make it in just 8. Hey, a birthday party every week? Sign me up! Oh, hold on, there's another problem. You see, Proxima Centauri is a flare star. This means that sometimes, just out of nowhere, it throws out some stellar winds. These winds carry around a bunch of ionized particles, which then settle on the planets. Yeah, our Sun also does that, but Proxima Centauri tries to finish us off 2,000 times harder than our Sun so the radiation levels are off the scale, to say the least. Don't worry, it's fine. All we need are incredibly strong magnetic fields. They will help us create a very thick atmosphere that can protect us from the Proxima Centauri's tantrums. So now it's going to be very warm, or not. Another problem. Scientists are still not sure how exactly Proxima Centauri's planets rotate around it. What if they turn out to be tidally locked, like our moon? Then one half of the new Earth will be a frying pan, and the other half will be some frosty deserts. Oh, it's fine, we'll just settle down somewhere in the middle. Didn't expect that I would ever say this, but it will definitely be warm at the North Pole. And if we're lucky with the rotation, we'll just get a cozy, warm planet. The average temperature is about 70 degrees Fahrenheit, and there aren't any extreme temperatures. On the new Earth, we have much more water. The weather is generally pretty crazy, some very strong winds and quite destructive rains that can go on for quite a long time, but you can adapt. 
Temperature changes are much more noticeable in the mountains. Just like on Earth, the higher you climb, the colder it gets, except it's very cold right here at the top. Because of this, the mountains and hills have jungles below and snow-covered deserts on the tops. But in general, it's almost like the Earth's tropics. The flora is very rich, the trees are very low, but lush. The thick atmosphere also makes flying easier, so there are a lot of large flying animals, like dragonflies with a wingspan of 16 feet. Uh-huh, moving on. The sky here is much lighter than that on Earth and very cloudy. Sometimes it may seem completely white. But the starry night is beautiful and bright. There are four suns. Our main one is Proxima Centauri. We can also see two bright Alpha Centauri stars. And finally, our old sun, which looks like a bright, distant star. I'll allow you to shed a tear for the old Earth. There's a few planets near us, like Proxima Centauri C. The host star is surrounded by two belts of cosmic dust, so get ready for some gorgeous, colorful night views. So what we have in the end is a little crazy, but a beautiful green planet. I personally wouldn't mind moving there already. What about you? Write in the comments. Alright, so now we know what would have happened if our Earth had been born near Proxima Centauri. What about the other two stars? Unfortunately, we won't be able to rotate near two stars at the same time. Scientists suspect that Alpha Centauri A and B have some kind of common planet that jumps from one orbit to another. But it's probably very cold. Let's choose Alpha Centauri A. Just like on the new Earth, here our average temperatures are about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. But now, the temperature variation is quite large. It goes from negative 100 degrees Fahrenheit at the South Pole to 113 degrees Fahrenheit at the equator. Eh, we'll be fine close to the north. The day is still 24 hours, and the orbital period is one year and one month. It's almost the same for the Alpha Centauri B, but the orbital period is about half a year. Other conditions are very similar to those on Earth. Changes in the seasons are almost not noticeable. The temperatures don't change much either. No matter where we settle down, the neighboring star will be clearly visible, but we probably won't see Proxima Centauri. And that's about it. Of course, all this assumes perfect conditions. Just like on Earth, one slightest change, whether it's a thin atmosphere or a bigger distance from the star, and it won't end well. We got really lucky with our Earth. But even so, the chances of finding a habitable planet are very high. Even with the tiniest possibility, there will be about 15 million planets in our universe that we can find life on. To see one of the most significant astronomical events of all time, we go to South America. In the Atacama Desert, Chile, we find the most advanced technology for space observation. Here, the Royal Astronomical Community members watched for six months as a black hole simply absorbed a massive star. By the way, these are the same scientists who prove that in the center of our Milky Way galaxy is a supermassive black hole, and even took a photo of it. For the first time in history, this incredible event happened very close to Earth. Well, the distance of 215 million light-years is considered quite close in astronomy terms anyway. Light from this event reached our planet in September of 2019, and even the most experienced scientists dropped their jaws in surprise. Imagine a star the size of our Sun, about 860,000 miles wide. Such stars have enough weight to create a strong gravitational field, holding many planets in their orbit. And now, Let's place a giant black hole next to it. The hole is absolutely black, shaped like a disk, and weighs a billion times more than this star. The force of its gravitational field is incredible. Nothing can leave its gravity force. Objects that can move at the speed of light will still fall into this black abyss. Even light itself cannot escape its boundaries. As soon as a star enters the gravitational field of a black hole, it has no chance. 
At first, it tries to resist the pull of the black hole. Still, the star's outer layers begin to stretch toward the black hole, just like spaghetti. This is due to a powerful force of attraction. If you had the opportunity to extend your hand toward the black hole, hmm. you would see your fingers begin to stretch and elongate. This is because the force of attraction increases with every inch. Therefore, it acts stronger on your fingers than on your arm. That's why this process of pulling objects into a black hole is called spaghettification. The first thing to be sucked into the black hole is the star's crown. This is the outer shell of the star, which consists of hot plasma. You may notice how the star begins to shrink in size. This is because that plasma makes up most of the visible sun. When this hot plasma spaghetti reaches the black hole, it may appear to remain on the disk's edge and continue to orbit the black hole. But in fact, there is no turning back anymore. The star's particles have already hit the event horizon of the dark abyss. The gravitational field of a black hole bends light around its edges, so the event horizon looks a bit like a croissant for the observer. Boy, lots of food metaphors here. I'm getting hungry. You may also notice a kind of chaos in this ring as if some light particles are moving in one direction and others in another. This happens because of a mirror effect. But you can be sure that whatever reaches the event horizon will, sooner or later, be pulled into the singularity, or the black pearl of the black hole. Another illusion you spot is the star particles in the event horizon moving slower. The truth is that supermassive objects like a black hole curve space-time around them. And the more massive the object, the slower time flows near it. If you hang one watch beside a black hole and another on a wall in your bedroom, you will see that the second hand in the first watch barely moves, while a whole day passes on Earth. As observers, it seems to us that the particles of light have slowed their movement. But in fact, they may have already been absorbed by the black hole ages ago. Now, massive streams of red-hot plasma splash into space, just like spaghetti sauce. <laughs> when a black hole has absorbed star material, it emits powerful rays of energy at a rate of about 6,200 miles per second. This release of energy is accompanied by an intense flash. It's thanks to this flash that scientists can even detect this process in the first place. This phenomenon can be observed when a supernova explodes. When nothing remains of the star's body, we can still see stardust and other particles in the black hole's event horizon. Kind of like the Parmesan cheese sprinkled on the spaghetti. Hey, stop me if I'm taking this too far. When the process of spaghettification is completed, about half of the star's weight has been thrown into outer space as dust and glowing particles. The other half was entirely absorbed by the black hole. The scientists observed this process for almost six months. But what would be more interesting is to dive into a black hole yourself. Well, we can't do that yet, but we can simulate this process. Here is a little drone, our metal friend, kind of like a meatball. No, I haven't had lunch yet. Right now, it's at a safe distance from the black hole, the length of about three widths of the event horizon. Objects at this distance can orbit the black hole safely. A little closer, and it'll be swallowed up by a dark infinity. So our destroyed star could have safely existed at this distance. Moreover, planets can live at this distance. And if there is a suitable source of light and heat somewhere nearby, life can exist on these planets too. But our goal is the singularity, and we guide the meatball, I mean the drone, closer to the event horizon. After a few minutes, the force of attraction begins to strengthen and the drone starts to stretch like spaghetti. When it begins spinning around the black disk, it means it has reached the event horizon and has started its descent into the black abyss. Now, let's look at everything from the drone's perspective. All the light from the stars that it sees becomes blue. This is called gravitational blue shift. As it falls into the black hole, its gravitational field pulls the photons of light down, giving them energy. Their wavelengths grow shorter, so the red photons change into blue. The drone continues to fall and is already completely hidden from our eyes. 
and all that the robot sees is a bright, thin blue beam. Now it's in complete darkness. There's absolutely nothing here, not even time. Here, time goes so slowly that our entire solar system could grow old and cease to exist during a minute spent in a black hole. But our drone will live until its battery is empty. Hey, the drone sees a small bundle of light again, and it's getting closer and more prominent. Now the drone will experience the same fall, only in reverse. Once the drone leaves the singularity, the heart of the black hole, it will be on the event horizon once again. The light from the stars gradually changes from blue to red. Then the drone is thrown into outer space, perhaps in some faraway galaxy. Well, returning from a black hole is just a theory. Some people think that black holes are a kind of wormhole that can lead us to distant places in space. But so far, these theories are considered fiction. Black holes are quite challenging to detect. The problem is, they are, well, black, just like space. They don't emit light like stars, so they can only be detected by gravity anomalies. Despite this, scientists believe there are a vast numbers of black holes in our universe. They're born when a massive star collapses under its own weight. And given the infinite number of stars in the universe, black holes are probably a common phenomenon. Scientists believe black holes have their own lifetimes. This is because of Hawking radiation. A black hole loses mass, and so, to continue existing, it has to absorb massive objects, like the star we just watched. But if the black hole lives in deep space, it has less to absorb and will most likely begin to shrink until it just disappears. Like this plate of spaghetti. Mmm. <laughs>